Hello, this is Evan Rogerson, and today I will be ranking VEX sensors on a tier list. This list is not comprehensive of all the VEX sensors, like there's the really old three-wire inertial sensors. I'm not going to be covering those, because um, I really don't have a lot of knowledge on them, and nobody uses them nowadays anyway. So, let's start. So, first off, we have the VEX V5 vision sensor. Um, I'm going to be honest and upfront here, I have never used the vision sensor on a robot personally. I've just spoken to lots of people and I've seen it used on robots. And overall, it seems kind of good for some things. There are certain applications that you can really only use a vision sensor for, like if you're trying to search and destroy, or in I guess for this case it would be grab a tribal and stick it in the goal. But usually, uh, autonomous routines in VEX are a lot more scripted. You don't really need to be searching for objects on the field, so that kind of limits its uses. But it does seem to do well when properly trained for objects, but then you do also have to worry about additional lighting as with all uh, vision related color sensors um, and different venues are going to have different lighting. Um, I remember like Haunted, it would be very bad if you were trying to use like a color sensor or something and you're just having to retune for different lightings. Like I know 7862D used one of these on their turret last year to aim at the goal and sometimes it would aim at the red mats on the gym walls. So it can be a little bit finicky, um, just subject to small changes. So overall, I'm going to give it C tier. When it works well, it's pretty good, but it's finicky and it's subject to a lot of environmental things and it's not super needed. A lot of the times you can code around it, like turrets weren't the best design last year, so you didn't really need a vision sensor. It makes turning significantly easier. Really, the only other way to calculate angle is by having two parallel vertical tracking wheels, or I guess they can be parallel on any orientation, and then calculating the difference of those to figure out your angle, which does work well. I used that on my Haunted Robot last year, but the inertial sensor is definitely significantly easier to use. It's just plug in and get the values. They're decently accurate on their own, although I found that you usually have to tune them out because they're only accurate within a couple of degrees after a revolution, and they are subject to inertial drift. They are kind of finicky. I would recommend what I use on my more competitive robots is having three inertial sensors on them and then kind of comparing the values between them and if one of them starts to drift, I just like ignore that, do an outlier search. But once you use all the implementation things, they are very, very, very good. Um, they're very easy to implement too, especially at just a low level. Like one inertial sensor just doing turn to heading works pretty well for most robots. They're really easy to implement, so I'm gonna go ahead and give them S tier just because of how easy they are to use. And once you use some higher level things, they're still viable. Um, they work just as well as the two tracking wheels to calculate angle. Next, we have the VEX V5 rotation sensor. Now, this is a really good sensor. It also functions as a potentiometer because it remembers its position even when you turn it off. So you can just say, hey, turn to 20 degrees, which is what I used on my lift for my first tipping point robot. You could just consistently go to the same position every time for like picking up a goal. Very useful in that regard. And then it can also be used for things like a flywheel if you want to measure RPM. I wouldn't personally recommend it for a flywheel just because you really care about friction. But other things like a catapult if you want it to rotate back to the same position every time, really good for that. Additionally, you can also use these for tracking wheels. I believe they get down, to, I think it's 5,000 tick marks for every revolution. So pretty accurate within 0.1 of your actual value on rotation. Very good, more than whatever you need for VEX. And then they also have high strength as an option, which is very useful for catapults. And then, like I said, you can use them on tracking wheels, which makes them very, very useful. So I'm also going to go ahead and leave these S tier. They're very, very good for odometry and certain things like catapult or other lift controls. Next up, we have the VEX V5 color sensor. You can differentiate the color sensor and the distance sensor. Let me just zoom in because the color sensor has a little eyeball on it and the distance sensor has like the little distance symbol thing, whatever. All right, moving on, we have the VEX V5 inertial sensor. So the color sensor, it has its uses and it works well in those uses, but the uses are kind of limited just overall. And again, it's a looking sensor, so it's also subject to environmental things. Uh, I, the times that I've used the color sensor were like sensing cycles for change ups. You could have automated sorting and that was useful. It was in a very controlled environment inside the robot. So lighting was pretty consistent. I believe it also comes with its own light so you can get more constant lighting. I haven't had any issues with it needing to really be retuned at a competition, although all of those competitions were high school gyms, so the lighting was fairly similar throughout them. I find it's good for close-up things if you just want to tell the color of something. Like cycling, like change-up, I would say is its best application, but it really doesn't have a whole lot of applications. 
Uh, it works well for what it does. So I'm going to go ahead and give it B tier. It's very useful, very reliable, but it just its applications are kind of limited. Now, moving on the distance sensor. This is another really useful sensor. Um, you can use them to like reset odometry and do like wall checks and stuff to like tell how far you are from the wall. I use them in tipping point for the goal rush because um, you want to know how far from the goal you are and like if the other team starts to move away. So it's very good for like goal rush applications. If you just want to like know how far from the wall you are, very useful for that. I found this sensor to be very reliable. Um, it doesn't need to be retuned at all. Uh, I haven't found lighting effect to it. And then another really cool use for it, which I cover more in the spin up world's explanation video is using it to like sense the number of discs inside the robot. So you can use it for small internal things. Like I found it was usually accurate within 0.1 inches. So very useful, very consistent. I'm also going to give this one an S tier just because of how useful it is and how versatile it is. Um, like every year you're going to have to know how far from the wall you are and it saves you time by doing a wall check. If you can just use a distance sensor to like reset your odometry. Next up we have the old uh, cortex potentiometers. The three wire ones, these ones are not as good as the V5 potentiometers. Um, they only have about 270 degrees of motion and they will snap and break if you go past that. Um, really they're only used for, for things like a lift or a catapult, but then it's also low strength and usually those applications require high strength. And you can just use the new V5 rotation sensor as a potentiometer, so its, it's uses are kind of limited. Um, it used to be good, but now it's not really, and it's really, really easy to break. Um, I've seen lots of middle schoolers break them, so I'm going to go ahead and give this one F tier. It's completely outclassed by the new rotation sensor and V5 potentiometer. All right, next up is the GPS sensor. Um, again, disclaimer, I have never used a GPS sensor. I have heard about them, and I've seen, like, one team using them. From what I have garnered online, these sensors aren't super reliable, and add on to the fact that they only work when there's a GPS strip on the field, which competition fields are not required to have. I know at Worlds they use portable field perimeters, so you know that you're going to have it there. But for local competitions, you don't necessarily know if you're going to have it. I haven't really seen teams use them. They're very expensive. I think they're like $200 or $250 a pop. And usually you need multiple sensors because you can't always see the perimeter strip from where one sensor is. So I'm going to go give a D tier. Like, yeah, they, they can do some cool stuff, but it's, it's finicky. Um, it's really expensive and it's unreliable just because of like fields might not have the strip on them. So this is a V5 motor, um, which you don't really think of as being a sensor, but the V5 motor actually contains two sensors within it. The first one being a internal motor encoder or IME, which essentially allows you to know how many degrees the motor is spinning. This is not something that all motors have. Um, like if you're new to VEX, you ha haven't used the 393 motors, and if you wanted to know the number of rotations on a 393 motor, you had to like hook it up to one of these quadratic encoders, which I'll get to later. Additionally, the motors also contain a temperature sensor. I don't use Fahrenheit because I'm Canadian, but the Celsius degrees is within 5 degrees, which isn't super accurate, but it's good enough for VEX stuff. Motors overheat at 55 degrees, room temperature is like 20 to 25 degrees. Um, it's accurate enough to tell when a motor's overheating, and I find it very useful to print those values to the brain screen, just so you can kind of always know what's going on. Um, so I'm gonna, kind of going to rate these together. The internal sensors for the motor, I'm going to give S tier, because internal motor encoders are super easy. Um, like if you just need something relatively imprecise, or I think I used my slingshot wind up last year, it was internal motor encoder just because it was direct drive. Oh, and the sensor is very useful just to know when your motor's overheating. Um, it's good for testing, and it's super easy to implement. You don't have to do anything. The values are right there, handed to you. Which is relatively newer. I have only used the version 1 bump switch, but I think they function the same. Essentially, you have to push it in, and it returns either a 1 or a 0 for whether or not it's pushed in or not pushed in. It's a 3-wire sensor. They're, of course, really reliable. It's either yes or no. And the only thing about them is they do require a decent amount of force. Like, you could use them to, like, know when you've hit the wall, but usually you can be smart with the internal motor encoders and check your drivetrain uh, RPM to kind of figure that stuff out. Usually they require more force than you want to have on VEX mechanisms just to be able to push in. I don't know if the newer ones are better with this, but overall, they're kind of meh. I prefer the limit switch, which I'll get to later. I'll give them a D tier. Like, they, they're, they work, but they don't really have a lot of uses. Now, next up is the limit switch. The limit switch is... It's a pretty good sensor. It functions the exact same as the bump switch, but I found this one to be a lot more sensitive, which is really good. You barely need to apply any force to kind of push that lever in, and then when the lever is pushed in, the sensor returns a one value. Uh, this one I've seen mostly used on things like catapults or lifts, so you can know exactly when the catapult is pulled back all the way because it pushes that back. 
And again, it doesn't really take any force. Like it works well, but there's just there's not a whole lot of uses where you would want to have it. So I'm going to go ahead and get, give it B tier. Like it, it works incredibly well. It's just its uses are rather limited. Same with the color sensor. All right, moving on is the next up. We have the version two bumps switch, and this sensor is. Pretty useful. The last time I used it was in changeup, and you can use it if you stick it on the bottom of your robot. Uh, it has to be pretty close to the ground, so you wouldn't want it in a game like Over Under where you can't have things close to the ground or it's really awkward to do. But I had it right on the ground, and I could use it to sense the tape lines because the tape lines are significantly brighter than the dark foam tiles. I believe the dark foam tiles return a value of around 300, and it's in the thousands when you get like I think around 2,000 to 3,000 when you go over the white tape line. Of course, it depends on your lighting environment which again is one of the drawbacks of this sensor. It's dependent on a lighting environment and this does not come up with its own light. You could pair it up with another sensor, but it is really useful to be able to know when the tape lines are there, especially during changeup because you were like strafing, or at least we were, and there are lots of tape lines for, for skills and like they lined up with the goals nicely. I haven't had to use it again, but I can imagine it would be useful for like a game. It's very useful line tracker. If you want to make sure that you don't cross the line, you can stick one of these on your robot if it lined up nicely so that it didn't like interfere with crossing over the barrier like I mentioned earlier. But they, they work pretty well, um, quite useful. Um, they really have only have one use, but sensing tape lines can always be a useful thing, and you really can't be too careful with making sure you cross over the autonomous line. I found them to be consistent just as long as you have a good lighting environment, and that was the big thing is once you build a proper area for it, the lighting is consistent. So I'm going to go ahead and give this A tier. It's very good. It's consistent once you tune it properly. Um, but really the only thing it's useful for is measuring whether or not you cross over the tape line, which is important. Some games it's more better than others, but in changeup when we used them, they were really, really good. All right, next up is the old quadratic encoders. So these encoders actually have two cores going in them, feeding into the brain. So these guys, they essentially work the exact same as these old rotation sensors, except they don't remember their positions. So they're only useful for things like tracking wheels where you want to know the relative distance. You can't use them for something like a lift because that's more on the absolute distance. You want to go to the same position. You don't want it to be dependent on your starting position. However, for tracking wheels, these are pretty useful. Some people still prefer to use them just for their mounting shape over the V5 inertial sensors. I believe they're accurate to one degree, which is good enough for most things. I found them a bit awkward to work with just because those holes right there are not like square or circle holes. They're kind of oval holes, so it gives you a little, little bit of slop. Um, I also found that they're not the best for friction. I use them for trackers on my Tipping Point World Spot, and they, they weren't the best. I know some people really like them for odometry, but their only use is for odometry. It's up a bunch of your through wire ports. You pretty much have to use an expander if you're using these frequently, especially now with pneumatics. So I'm going to go ahead and give it C tier. Like it's, it's fine. Um, very specific application and some people just prefer to use these sensors. All right, finally, we have the new V5 potentiometer. This one has 330 degrees of sensing and unlike the old Cortex potentiometers, it does not snap if you go past it. It just kind of resets around the beginning. It just has a 30 degree dead zone. Um, it only works for low strengths. They're pretty small, definitely smaller than the rotation sensors. I would personally recommend using the rotation sensor for most things just because they're easy and they work for high strength. But these guys, I believe they're a little bit less expensive. I think they're like seven and a half dollars a pop, whereas the rotation sensor is closer to $50. So if you're using these, they definitely work well for some applications, kind of where the old potentiometers would work. Maybe if you have a lift and it's low strength, um, and again, it only has 330 degrees of range of motion, but it's not, you're not going to break anything if you go past it. So uses are kind of limited, um, kind of outclassed by some other sensors. Really the only re reason you would want to use it is like space or if you're low on budget. So I'm going to go ahead and give it D tier. So going back through editing, I think there is one change that I want to make, and that is the line tracker right there. Originally I had it in A tier, but I decided to move it down to B tier. That is because I believe that odometry can kind of make up for a lot of the uses that you would use a line tracker for. If you have a good, accurate odometry system, you're not really going to need where, to sense where the tape lines are. This would just kind of be an unnecessary extra precaution. I could see it being useful in an especially game like Over Under, where it's very tricky to fit tracking wheels on your robot, or for newer teams that don't quite understand how odometry works. This sensor can be pretty easy to implement. You can just kind of say, like, drive forward till you hit the tape line. So I think that concludes all my thoughts on this. If you guys have any questions, please ask down in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them quickly. And then if you have any suggestions for future videos, also leave those too. And if you haven't had your state championships, good luck in those.